A few weeks ago, the U.S. military um, intentionally bombed a hospital in Kunis, Afghanistan. I mean, the U.S. government felt it enough to just apologize. And there's people leaping to the defense of the establishment here, saying there must have been a good reason. Either they did it on accident, even though that we know that they didn't, or, um, you know, there was Taliban hiding in there, and so it justified, obviously, this human shield logic, just like Israel does. I mean, how does this specific example illustrate how American exceptionalism functions? Well, we have to be careful about the term American exceptionalism. And for one thing, it's not at all exceptional. Mm -hmm. Every imperial power has behaved the same way, uh, sometimes worse. So it's just normal imperial practice. It's called exceptionalism, but nothing about that. Of course, it's called, it's supposed to be exceptional in that uh, we have the highest ideals. So maybe we make mistakes, but it's always with the highest ideals. That's American exceptionalism. Except that, too, is true of every, just about every imperial power. So when the British were um, destroying the world, uh, they were always doing it with the absolutely highest ideals, the leading figures, leading intellectuals. Uh, people like John Stuart Mill, estimable people, were describing England as an angelic country beyond anything that anyone's ever imagined. Uh, people can't understand how marvelous we are and so on. Uh, the French were the same. It's uh, hard to find an exception. So there's no exceptionalism. The, uh, 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 in the case of the Kunduz Hospital, apparently, I, mean, I don't think all the details have come out, but it seems that they were trying to kill uh, some people they regarded as Taliban leaders or activists. And they happened to be in the hospital, so they killed everybody. And there's a lot of there is a lot of criticism of killing the others. What about killing the person they were targeting? I mean, what right do we have to kill somebody in some other country who we don't like? I mean, I don't like them either, you know, don't like the Taliban at all. But does that mean we have a right to go kill them? I mean, do they have a right to go kill us if they don't like us? That's not questioned at all. What's questioned is, and criticized, is attacking a hospital and uh, killing the staff and killing the patients. And, you know, that's not the first time. So, for example, when the, uh, when the U.S., one of the uh, lauded achievements of the U.S. Army in uh, Iraq is the conquest of Fallujah in November 2004. Uh, take a look at it. Just take a look at the New York Times, the days of the attack on Fallujah. The first day of the attack, there's a picture on the front page. You can practically visualize it. Uh, which is a picture of the General Hospital in Fallujah. Marines attacked the General Hospital, uh, threw the patients off their beds, put them on the floor, put shackles around them, threw the doctors on the floor. Uh, uh, went, uh, attacking a hospital is a gross violation of international law. But they were asked, and they were asked, why did you attack it? They said because it was a propaganda agency for the rebels. How was it a propaganda agency? It was releasing casualty figures. Uh, that was okay. That's an achievement. But even beyond that, what were the Marines doing in Fallujah? I mean, are there uh, Iranian Marines in, the, uh, in Cambridge? Uh, what are U.S. Marines doing in Iraq? Uh, the invasion of Iraq is uh, the worst crime of this century. It's had horrible effects, but uh, it's now you know, spawned uh, sectarian conflicts that are tearing the region apart. But suppose it had worked. Suppose it had pacified Iraq and uh, there was no disasters. It's still a major crime. Uh, why do we have the right to invade another country? And in fact, if you look back, there's, there's another crime which is never discussed. In the 1990s, the sanctions on Iraq were so severe that they virtually destroyed the society. In fact, the, the sanctions were administered by the United Nations. And the, uh, the international diplomats who administered the sanctions were respected international diplomats. Uh, Dennis Halliday, Hans von Sponek. They both resigned in protest. 
on the grounds that the sanctions were genocidal. Mm -hmm. Their term, not mine. They said the sanctions are genocidal, they're destroying the society, they're strengthening the dictator, they're forcing the population to rely on him for survival, and probably they saved him from being overthrown from within, as happened to one after another, a dictator of the same sort. That was the 1990s. Uh, that's considered no problem. You know, that was liberal Democrats. Uh, well, I mean, by the time that Bush and Blair decided to invade Iraq, the society was half devastated. Mm -hmm. So you hit a very fragile system with a sledgehammer, you're going to have horrible results. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the very idea of invading is criminal. And try to find someone who describes it as a crime. Right. Um, Obama is praised because he describes it as a mistake. Does he describe it as a crime? Does anyone? Oh, except way out at the fringes. It was the dumb war, right? And dumb war. Yeah, we dumb shouldn't war. do dumb things. We do smart yeah, things. Yeah, we do smart wars. It's well, like uh, German generals after Stalingrad who says it's really stupid to have a two-front war. We should have destroyed England first. Well, I always think it's interesting that people use the rationale that we didn't find WMDs as if that would have been a rationale to invade and occupy a country, finding weapons of mass destruction. I mean, of it's insane. Not. And in fact, completely insane. You know, if, they, if they're concerned about weapons of mass destruction, there are ways to proceed. The UN inspectors are doing a fine job. Actually, the same, pretty much the same, similar questions arise in the case of the Iran nuclear deal. So Iran, according to the United States, uh, poses a grave threat to the world. That's pretty much an American and Israeli obsession. And most of the world doesn't see it that way. Uh, but uh, say, let's say it's a threat. Suppose Iran poses a threat. How do you, are there simple ways of uh, dealing with this? In fact, there are. And in fact, very popular ones. Uh, the best way to deal with it would be to work towards uh, instituting a nuclear weapons-free zone in the region. That's supported by almost the entire world. It's strongly supported by Iran. In fact, they're one of the leading advocates of it. Yeah, when you're not even acknowledging that Israel has them, then That's the you? problem. The U.S. won't permit it because it does not want Israeli nuclear weapons to be open to inspection. So therefore, we block the obvious way to deal with whatever problem there is. And it is supported by virtually the entire world. Comes up every five years at the uh, Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference. And in fact, the continuation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty is actually contingent on doing this. That was agreed 20 years ago. That's the most important arms control treaty there is. Mm -hmm. If that treaty collapses, we're gone. Everybody will have nuclear weapons mm -hmm. and be using them. But the U.S. is so committed to protecting Israel's nuclear weapons that it's willing to uh, endanger the non-proliferation treaty and prevent the obvious means from uh, keeping nuclear weapons away from Iran in case they have any interest in developing them. Do you see a word of discussion of this outside of the arms control literature and you know, I write articles? But, uh, way out of the fringes. Nothing that could possibly make the uh, uh, mainstream. There's this huge amount of grassroots energy donations um, around getting people elected who are believed to be able to give us solutions to the problems that we face, Noam. Um, what do you think we should be focusing our energy on? Take, say, the Bernie Sanders campaign, which I think is important, impressive. He's doing good and courageous things. He's organizing a lot of people. That campaign ought to be directed to sustaining a popular movement which will use the election as a kind of an incentive, but then go on. And unfortunately, it's not. When the election's over, the movement's going to die. And that's a serious error. Um, the only thing that's going to ever, ever bring about any meaningful change is ongoing, dedicated, popular movements which don't pay attention to the election cycle. 
It's an extravaganza every four years. You have to be involved in it, so fine. We'll be involved in it, but then we go on. Uh, if that were done, you could get major changes.